Hey, everybody, Dennis and Julie, Dennis Prager and Julie Hartman. I hope you enjoy this as much as we do. Isn't that something we do? What number is this, like 80-something? 80 80-something, 80 yeah. 82. Yep. Holy moly. The first one, Julie, was in eighth grade when we began. <laughs> Julie was a senior in college. I think it was March of my senior now, year. Now, here is my, my, my prediction. I remember making it to you was how rapidly college will seem far distant. You, is that, Was I right? Yes. I, and you, don't, don't tell me to make me feel good. It actually scares me a little bit because I'm 23 years old. I feel old, but I know intellectually I'm not old yet. But I feel like college is so in the rearview mirror. You know, the other day I was actually quizzing myself where certain buildings are that I used to go to in college or names of the buildings and names of professors. And it's amazing how quickly you forget. Well, without dwelling much on it, it's not only true about college. When something ends, a any period of life, I, I mean... I, when I got divorced, that marriage seemed like it was so long before. Mm. When you make, it's a radical change to leave college, right? It's, it's a cocoon. It's its own world. Now it's gone, completely gone. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's the way life works. Once it's, if something's over, I wonder if that happens with regard to loved ones. I don't, that I, I can't answer that because I haven't lost, you know, I've obviously lost my parents, but th- that's part, part of life in a normal scheme of things. Things, But I, I wonder, you know, let's say there's so many widows and widowers out there. Does their married life with them seem like the far distant past within a few mm-hmm. months? I don't know the answer. I don't either. Question for you. I talk about this a lot with some of my former classmates. I have many friends from college. I feel very blessed. And I have many friends from high school who went to different colleges, and we discuss this. Really kind of ending the college years and being catapulted into, quote, unquote, real life is a is a daunting and at times difficult experience. I mean, that's not exactly new. People talk about that. But I'm wondering, do you remember that transition? Because one of the things that we discuss, especially for for, uh, people who I went to high school and college with, because we all kind of had similar upbringings where we worked super hard in high school, did sports, you know, we're, we're, we're getting straight A's to get into a good college. When we were in college, we were also trying to get really good grades, trying to do all these activities. You know, I, I am a very, uh, ambitious, motivated person. And a lot of my friends are, are similar in that we're very hard workers. But now that we're in real life, we talk about how it's much harder to, define success and define happiness because for the pre for the past 10 to 15 years the path was prescribed for you you knew that you had to get good grades you had to have good activities you had to get into a good college of course that's the milieu that i was in that's not the case for everyone i'm just talking about my cohort to use your favorite word which by the way dennis and julie listeners thank you they always take my side on that one the cohort issue just Mm -hmm. saying Mm -hmm. just saying Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was it was very prescribed in college. It was very prescribed. And now it's like you can move to Montana and become a ski instructor if you want to. Or you can go work. You know, you can never get married. You can get married. There's in other words, there's there's no longer the prescribed path. And I think for 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 me and some of my peers being just thrown out like that without your next accomplishment ahead of you is difficult because you have to figure out who you are what you want did you have that well i I, you could now go to the ladies room and come back and i'll still be talking because i have so much to say about that first of all you asked me did i have this realization of the transition from college to real life Mm -hmm. so i i don't know if I laughed on camera or not, but I... You did. Well, I saw you. I, yeah. Well, yeah. so I'll tell you why I laughed. 
I had the opposite of college experience. <laughs> My college was real life. There was no difference, almost virtually no difference between my college life and real life. I, I didn't, I, I missed most classes. I did very well, but I, I, they didn't care about attendance. I did, I did my papers and I did my exams. The third year I was in England. It was during that time I was sent to the Soviet Union by, by the Israeli government. Yes. It's not like I had not been in real life during in college. And, uh, you know, I, I've told you the, the very, very funny Prager family story. One one day, I was, so my my first years, because it was Brooklyn College, my parents lived in Brooklyn, I lived with my, at my parents' home. I wasn't dorming at school. There was no dorm at Brooklyn College. It was all commuter. So my I said to my mother one, one day, I love, I truly love this story because it so describes me. And, and my iconoclastic personality. I said to her, Mom, I'm, I'm off this week. And totally seriously, she looked at me and said, oh, I thought you were off last week. Yes. She didn't even know when I had school because I, I missed so many classes and because I would spend so much time in Manhattan going to cultural things and bookstores and concerts and so on. So... There was very little difference between real life, quote unquote, and college life. The next arena that you raised was what again? Because I really did want to comment on that too. That you define your own happiness. Oh, that's right. Okay, now. this is critical. This is really critical. So I am about as much my own person as you know me. I am my own man. I, I march to my own drummer, etc. But I want to tell you something. I did have a prescribed life, and thank God I did. I knew I would get married and have children, like you know that you will get up tomorrow. It was it was not in the realm of, gee, I wonder if I'll get married, I wonder if I'll have kids. Mm. I mean, obviously, if I couldn't get have kids, I couldn't have, by the way, in, in, indeed it did happen. Right. That uh, my wife uh, couldn't conceive at the time, <laughs> And I did adopt a child. So I, I knew I would have a kid. I don't care, adopted blood. That, as you know, my blood my, schmud, my, my, as blood you say. Schmud, that's exactly right. So uh, that, that was a huge help in my inner stability. When you have to even decide, gee, I don't know, will I get married? Gee, I don't know, will I have children? Well, what the hell do you know? And then the other thing you said, which is really a very common phrase and I'm not a fan of it. Well, you know, I want to I want to find out who I am. I never I don't know if I spent 10 minutes in my life trying to find Dennis. I was trying to find who Dennis should be. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great subject not necessarily for us now, but for everyone's life. Looking for you is a waste of time. Looking for whom you should be, that's that's key. I agree with you. However, the reason I said that is because, again, I, and I'm speaking about a particular co cohort. Now I'm just saying it to tick you off. I'm just going to keep throwing it in there. It, it is a little obnoxious. <laughs> I really don't get your opposition to it. Anyway, we could fight about that all day. But I'm speaking about a particular cohort where... A lot of the people who I went to high school and college with, we were so on the overachieving track, which by the way, for many of us was kind of handed down by our parents. I would I would say about of course. eighty well, to ninety percent of people right. at Harvard are are these are the products of helicopter parents. Right. And so I think that a lot of people graduate and they, they just follow, you know, I'm going to go to business school, I'm going to go to this firm, I'm going to go to law school, I'm going to do this. And I don't think that they know who they are. I mean, I hear you when you say who you should be. Okay, no, that's but, very but, fair. But in high school, you know, you talk about, I knew I knew who I was. I mm -hmm. knew that I liked the conducting symphonies. I wanted to learn Russian. I liked, you know, going to 
whatever the heck you did instead of going to high school. And I don't think a lot of my peers, and I'm not wagging the finger. I kind of went through this in high school. Like I need to figure out who Julie is and not what Julie thinks Julie should be. But I'm not so convinced that many people in my cohort, haha, know what their interests are. And I hate this word passion because I just think it's I overused. like the word passion. Really? Yeah. I, don't, I don't like it. I think passion is for like the heat of the intimate sexual moment that's when i when i hear the word passion well your I think mind of, is so often on sex that yeah, I, I so am often. telling you there are other subjects Julie. <laughs> oh right hilarious hilarious Hello. that dennis prager this is saying is, this, this to me a total joke okay go I ahead know. yeah no but no, no you, passions hear... are a big that's a very very valid point and i don't know i don't know the the perfect answer so let me modify what i said you can spend your life in, 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 as I put it in a dismissive way, which is wrong, but I, the way I put it, contemplating your navel, which is a dismissive way, I fully acknowledge. On the, so there's got to be, there are really two things. Who am I or what is my nature? What is, I don't know who I am I fully means, but what am I composed of? What what right. do I really care about? What 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 makes me tick? What are my habits? What am I good at? What am I not good at? Mm-hmm. These are very important things to know. But at at least as important is what do I want to be? I don't mean by profession. Yes. What person do I want to be? I knew very early on I want to be a good man. That, that's a very big deal. How many young people would say that? Very few, because many young people, and many people in general, not just young people, don't view your character as your accomplishment. They view your your job, your salary, what car you drive, what jewelry you have or your wife has, you know, material items. That's how they define their success. I know you, and you really believe screw the, I mean, I know that you're, you're proud of yourself and your work and as you should be, but I know that, that for you, your greatest accomplishment in your life is the man that you have made yourself into, not the radio host, not the famous conservative commentator, not the head of, or the founder of PragerU, this extraordinary organization. It's you, but a lot of, a lot of people don't view it that way. They view that as maybe a nice accompaniment to the on paper accomplishments, but they don't view the char- your character as an accomplishment. You know when I, if you don't mind, I know, do you want to go no, in no, before no, I continue? No, 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 please, no. So I know I talked about this on Timeless. I don't know if I said it on Dennis and Julie, but I was, I had a moment recently where I really realized that your character is your greatest accomplishment in life. I've always believed that, I've known that, but there was something that really drove it home to me. Uh, I was in London about two months ago during that London Berlin trip. And I love whenever I'm in London to go, I love going to Westminster Abbey. Have you been to Westminster yep. Abbey? Oh my gosh. It is not one of my favorite places on earth. It is my, mm. it is the favorite place on choice. earth for me. It, it, it's extraordinary. And so even though I'm, I'm lucky to have been several times, whenever I go, I block off like five hours just to, to go and, and, be in there. Kings and Queens are buried there. Darwin, Newton. I mean, it just the artwork, the architecture, it's extraordinary. So when I was there two months ago, I decided that I would try to go into parts of the Abbey that I hadn't spend mu- spent much time. When you put on the, the earphones and do the guided tour, they take you to like where Queen Victoria is buried. I decided to go off into like a little corridor where everyday people were buried because Three centuries ago, you could pay a sum of money to have your wife, your deceased wife, your deceased daughter, son buried in the abbey. I went over, Dennis, I was reading these people's gravestones. These are just everyday people. And I was moved to tears by the inscriptions of them. I was expecting it to be like, Lord Duke Grantham the Eighth from, you know, this place uh, was buried here, etc. It wasn't. It was, it was a soliloquy about the person's character and specifically every single inscription had to do with the way that those individuals dealt with hardship 
there was one that said that there was a 20 year old girl who died of typhus and 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 there was this beautiful inscription like she faced her illness with the stoicism of a true Christian. I mean, it was just, they talked about what kind of wives and mothers and friends these people were. And I was reading it and I know it sounds so corny, but I was crying and I felt the strangest emotion that you can feel in front of a gravestone, envy. I wish I had known these people because mm. they seem to be so wonderful. And that's when I realized who cares, you know, because many of these people did come from the Lord, Duke, whatever backgrounds. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that they were in parliament. It didn't matter that they were the, you know, number one advisor to the king. The inscriptions about who they were and how they made other people feel, that's what mattered. There's a great video up on the internet. Anyone could watch it. It's called For Goodness Sake. Oh, yes. It's the so video great. I made 30 years ago with Alan Estrin. I'm the quote-unquote star of it, and there are a lot of famous, at the time, Hollywood stars in it. It's funny, but it's all my views on goodness and ethics. So there's a great scene there of, of a scenario. You know, I make up scenarios a lot. And the scenario is a, a pastor eulogizing a guy who has just died. And what does he talk about? Of course, the guy's moral achievements. Mm -hmm. And then I said, but in an, and then I gave an alternate speech, which is hilarious about what a great car collection the guy had. <laughs> you know, who cares? Right. It, it, it's 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 sad. The point that I was making in that in those scenes is that it almost takes death for us to understand what really matters. Oh, yeah, it does take that. Yeah, no, nobody says, unless there's nothing else to say, nobody says, well, you know, he, he was such a terrific lawyer. Who, who gives a damn? But was he, was he a good father? Was he a good friend? Was he a, was he a, a good husband? Was he honorable? Did, did, did people admire him and like him? That's, that's what matters. Mm -hmm. So... And that's how I raised my kids. I, as, as you know, I didn't care if they went to college. And I didn't care if they went to college, what college they went to. It was all character. I never asked them their grades. I didn't give a damn about their grades. You know, you read what you just said about that scene in For Goodness Sake, which, by the way, I think is an incredible film. It's unbelievable. It's a really, really good one. It's funny, and there's a great moral message. So shout out to that. But it got me thinking. A lot of modern day obituaries are kind of resumes. Have you have you noticed that? If you go to the New York Times, you know, obituary section, a lot of it well, is Well, obituary, they're not going to comment on your character. That that's true. I mean, you can't Why not? Because they don't know it. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, that that's fair, but well, I think the family members write the obituary and submit mm -hmm. it. Really? No, I or don't even, think so. Okay, I all think right. This... Maybe for the New York Times it's different. But yeah. if you read a local newspaper. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, in the, in the family. I, I remember so. when my grandpa died, my uncle wrote it and put oh, it in the Massachusetts and, All right, local and that newspaper. was about character. I don't, honestly, I can't remember. It was so long okay. ago. I, I'd have to reread it. But I, 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 I noticed, because I like reading obituaries. Maybe it's weird. I don't know. But it kind of fascinates me. How did the person die? What, you know, what did they? But it's a resume. I would rather read about the character of a stranger in the New York Times than what they did for a living. So if you could make, I mean, your whole career has been making the case for this, but if you could make like a three to five sentence case for why one's character is their greatest accomplishment, to what would you say to, to someone who's graduating from college? This whole, you know, going well, back to this. I have the answer in my in sure, the film, go for goodness sake. By the way, people should watch it. As I said, it's free. It's on the internet. Just put in, for goodness sake, Dennis Brager. And, and it'll, it'll, it should come up. But I, I give the answer there. I was always going to say, it'll, if nothing else, it'd be interesting for people to see me 30 years ago. People get a kick yeah, out that, of that. With your huge glasses. Yeah, with my huge glasses. And your hair, too, is different. So I, I give the answer there, and that is, what, what do we want most from everyone else on Earth? 
there is an answer from everyone on who we will ever come into contact with what we want is that they be good people so don't think in those terms you're you're absolutely right absolutely, but people don't think I'm about absolutely that absolutely right that's the thing we most want from others is that yes. they be good it's the but it's not the thing we most want from ourselves mhm so that, that, we want that's everyone else to be good, that's but right. we can get away with whatever we can get away or, with. Or, or concentrate on something else, making right. money. Okay, indulge me for a minute. I just want to read one or two of these ins- inscriptions. I think it will be very touching yeah, to you. Please, yeah, please. I'm, I'm literally standing there crying. <laughs> these people I didn't know. I think everyone in the Abbey is looking at me like, cuckoo. Okay, ready? Uh, piety to God and benevolence to man were the principles which occupied his thoughts and directed his life. Mm. Actuated by a lively sense of religion, he enjoyed that serenity of mind and cheerfulness of temper by which Christianity is so peculiarly distinguished. His extensive bounties were dispensed with liberal but secret magnificence, seldom disclosing even to whom the even to those whom they received, the source whence they flowed. Public institutions, distressed individuals, private friends experienced the benefit of his well-regulated economy. Hmm. It's, I mean, just just stuff like that. I mean, you read that and you go, well, the whole thing don't you is wish about you knew that the, person? Well, and the whole, well, it says more than anything what they valued. Yes. I mean, they they didn't talk about his outer accomplishments. No, um, this this is the the typhus twenty year old. Her form, the most elegant and lovely, was adorned by the native purity and simplicity of her mind, um, which was improved by every accomplishment education could bestow. It pleased the Almighty to visit her in the bloom of her life with a lingering and painful disease, which she endured with fortitude and Christian resignation. Mike Lindell has a passion to help you get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop at the pillow. Mike also created the Giza Dream bed sheets, which I use. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep, which is crucial for our overall health. Mike found the world's best cotton called Giza. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. Mike's latest deal is the sale of the year. For a limited time, you'll get 50% off of the Giza Dream sheets, marking prices down as low as $29 and 98 cents depending on the size go to mypillow.com and click on the radio podcast square and use the promo code hartman there you'll find not only this great offer but also deep discounts on all my pillow products including the my pillow 2.0 mattress topper my pillow kitchen towel sets and so much more call 1-800-566-6745 or go to mypillow.com and use the promo code hartman it's about it's all of that is about how you helped other people, how you reacted in the face of hardship. It it, it was it was just amazing. Okay, I want to find one more. I'm but sorry. religion doesn't matter. Reli- yeah, exactly. Religion is antiquated. Who cares about religion? Oh, okay. Another one. He had unblemished conduct in every relation of life, of manners gentle and prepossessing, combining with great legal knowledge, extraordinary powers of persuasive eloquence. He attained with the esteem, admiration, and goodwill of all who witnessed his brilliant character. How old was he? Uh, Let's see. 63. No, no, much younger. Huh. Looks like he was about 40 when he died. Hmm. That was the average age, I suspect. Yes. He died in 1846. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, that late? You should go. You would You would love it. Everyone, go to the parts of Westminster Abbey that are not frequently visited. This is a big problem, though. This is, I mean, to, to state the obvious, that people really don't think your character matters. There, I, I did a show on Oh, they time- think everybody else's character matters. Well, exactly. Matters. I did a show on Timeless about this growing uh, worldview, especially among people my age, that life is a game. I heard someone in college really? say this. Really? What does oh, that yes. mean? Well, there was, this, there was this guy in college who was a total blankety blank, one of the worst people I've ever met in my life, and he would brag about how he cheated on exams. Mm-hmm. And I said to him once... We were in a common room and I said to him once, 
why are you why do you do that and why do you brag about it and he looked at me and he said life is a game there are winners and there are losers and if you play the game well you win and if you don't play the game well you lose i'm playing the game well because everyone else is playing the game so i've got to beat them at the game that we're all in you know what i wonder i wonder if he's happy I, I, well, I, I, truly, I truly hope he's not because he's such an awesome no, no, person. I, agree I don't with you. think he is. Uh-huh. That's that, that's the thing. I, I the one the one source of comfort, in addition to the belief that you say is the is uh, that gives you sanity that God will punish it's an afterlife, right? The, yes. But the one thing that that I think is a form of cosmic justice on Earth is that I think it, it is impossible for someone like that guy to truly be happy, to your point. Because if you're seeing everything from what angle you can go at it from, how to manipulate the situation, how to use this person, this class, this professor, this test to advance yourself, you're not going to attract genuine good people and relationships into your life. And I think too, and maybe this is just, again, what I tell myself to comfort myself, I think he knows he's a fraud. I don't think he go I don't think he ever feels the sense of pride and accomplishments that you feel when you know that you've done something the right way and really earned something based on your own merit. He doesn't have that. He bragged about cheating on tests? Yes. And by, and by the way, this was one person. I don't want people to think this was like everyone at, you know, who I went to college with. I, I I went to college with many great people. But yes, it was this one guy. Of course, he was like an eighth generation you know, legacy, fil- uh, filthy rich, so entitled, and yet he would he would literally go around and brag about all of like it, like it was it was a, a badge of honor the way that he manipulated this situation, how he got an A on his economics exam without even studying because he, you know, he, was ne- he paid some kid to sit next to him and cheated off his exam. It was this weird like I. I can manipulate, I am so smart and cunning that I can manipulate this situation and do no work, but get the outcome that all these fools who did do work get. I had a distant relative who married into the family. Well, that's all I'll say. So he'd be <laughs> unidentifiable even by people who are in my family. And he's, he passed away years ago. I mean, he was my, but he was my age. He passed away at a young age, relatively speaking. Anyway, I remember visiting uh, him and his wife, who was in my originally in my family. He married in, as I said. And I'll never forget, on two occasions, he told me how he figured out ways of sneaking things in to the country and not paying customs. Mm-hmm. At that t- today, they've pretty much abolished it. You, 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 you could bring in anything, basically. Mm-hmm. But then you had to fill out a form if you brought in more than a hundred dollars worth, and they would pay some duty on on what you on what you brought in. So a lot of people lied, uh, you know, or they they just they bringing in eighty dollars worth when they're bringing in eight hundred dollars worth, and they get through, and that's fine. I'm not even judging that because people pay so many taxes anyway in America that I, I, I'm I'm not judging people who did that. I am judging him though on this. This is really important to me. He told me the ways he, with great, a great sense of pride, he told me how he cheated the government when he came into the country. He would actually give other passengers some of the things he had bought so that they would be taking it in because they, they went under the limit. Right. And he would have much less to report. Or suitcases with hidden compartments. And all I thought was, listen, if if you don't pay your fair share of of duty when you come into the country, I'm not I'm not here to judge you on that one. But don't brag about it, like this is a great achievement on your part. That that's that was to me worse. Does that make sense to you? Of course, yes, yes, it is because you're. Because at least there's some shame if you keep it to yourself. Yes. You're not proud That's what it is. of being a cheat. That's exactly what it is. Mm. A lot of people, when they choose to behave well, and, and I and I relate to this to, to an extent, 
think a lot of people do it because they feel better behaving ethically than behaving unethically. And I've always wondered, I want to ask you, is that is that not a great thing if if one of the primary reasons that you are behaving well is because of the good feeling that you get? In other words, shouldn't you this just... This is, okay, this is... Classic Christian question. That's right. I knew you were going to say that. Yes, and by the way, <laughs> I'm thrilled that you knew I was going to say that because it means that what I have been saying has been clear to you. It doesn't matter. Mm. Uh, and and I, this is worthy of... It might so, matter a little bit. No, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, uh, okay. This is my old... This is my old... Oh, one of my oldest themes in, speak, in speeches. If a guy gives a lot of money to a hospital uh, for... Whoops, my... my uh, can I just pause for a minute? You know that always happens to you on your radio show. I know and it's on really this show? It, it's terrible. Can I ask you a a non judgmental? Yes. Why question? don't I set it? Yes. It's a do you totally, not learn to turn it off? No, I do not. That is exactly correct. I do not. Okay. So th- this has been an ongoing uh, example that I have given in lectures as far back as I remember. A guy gives a certain amount of money to build an oncology wing at a hospital. Oh, yes. I know that. And the reason he did it was because he wants his name on the wing. Okay? The Fred Cohen Oncology Wing. And And the only reason that we know of, at any rate, or even he admits to, the only reason I did it is I want my name in perpetuity on this oncology wing at XYZ Hospital. Your mother gets treated effectively for cancer thanks to this guy's oncology wing. How do you feel towards this guy? 100% grateful. Yes. Let us say the guy did it solely because he wants to help people with cancer. Will you feel better toward that guy? I doubt it. You know, it's very interesting how this has become such a big subject publicly. Dennis Prager and his arguments that thoughts don't matter uh, nearly as much as actions. Actions like have it 10 times more important, 50, 100 times more important than thoughts. I'm passionate on this issue. Agreed. I agree with you on that. So therefore, and by the way, there's another reason it doesn't matter. You said, well, doesn't it matter a little that... Does, or Dennis, does it matter at all at what, the reason that the guy wanted it because he wants his name on, on the building or, or the whatever it is? And how, how the hell do we know why we did that in any event? We do not know all our motives. None of us. The most self-aware human being does not know all of his or her motives. It is not knowable to the human being let alone the next guy's motives. That is why I judge me and I judge others by their behavior. The number of people, I get so passionate on this issue. It's amazing. I love it. Okay, well, thank you. Sometimes I'm afraid I get too passionate on it. No, (laughs) Dennis. The number of people with good intentions who do crap, who do evil, who do horrible things to human beings is in the tens of millions Every piece of crap human who supported communism meant well. I hear you. Well said. Agreed. So then let's get this out of our minds. It doesn't matter what you think. I think it matters how you act and how you act shapes how you think. Do good, do good, do good, do good. Then you'll think good. Think good, think good, think good, think good. You won't do good. Harumph. Okay, I got it out. (laughs) No. No, but you're right. You're right. The reason why I said I think it matters a little is because, let me give you a another example. You talked about the guy. Hold donating. on, I gotta put my phone. <laughs> you know what? We should just pick up whoever's calling and be like, "You're live on D and J." Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> it's so funny. I hear you. We I hear okay. you on your radio show. No, no, it's, it's depressing. It is depressing. Okay, go ahead. Okay, you gave the example about the guy donating, and it's a great example. It is. I, in high school, I actually, I need to write an article about this, uh, this, this trend. 
then again, I went to private school. I think this is a lot more common among people who go to private school than, than public school. But, but in high school, a lot of my peers would start charities to get into college, to put on their college application, okay? And it was mm-hmm. like a phenomenon, and it was right. absurd. You have all, you know, these privileged people who were like, and you know what the charity was? You go on a damn website, and you click donate, and they have a link for you to donate to whatever. I mean, it was it was obscene. It was totally obscene. And so there's an argument, oh, well, if it means that, you know, 500 more dollars was donated to uh whatever then then you know more people were were benefited as a result of that but there was something to me that was so hollow and frankly i i think immoral to to in the name of helping people use that for conveniently only like ninth through 12th grade the second these people got into college poof the charities disappeared how shocking you think the the charities quote-unquote charities continued into college no all of their concern and their volunteer work and all that stuff evaporated the second they got that acceptance letter and i just i i don't know i think people like that deserve to be called out and so i get your argument that that maybe it did do some good, but I don't think those people are going to go on for the rest of their lives and be charitable. I think what the lesson that they learned from that was I can use charity when it helps me with something that I want, and then I can throw out charity once right. I've gotten so, that. Uh, so I think these people here, deserve to be called out. Okay, maybe. And exposed well, for their exposed, true motives. Because they stopped when they graduated, I, I, I understand that your ability to judge them is exists you don't really give a damn you just want to get into a good college by showing you the charitable work so i i I have the following responses first of all obviously charitable work only matters if it really helps people right if it's just a resume filler then you didn't do charitable work. Right. You did pseudo charitable work or the act of charitable work. You you acted. That doesn't count. But if let us say, to use my example, somebody got chemotherapy thanks to that charitable work. Do you so what would you say to the recipient of the chemotherapy? There's no reason for you to thank this kid. They only did it to get into a good college. No, no, I hear your point. Okay, not that. But but this is, but what we're arguing about isn't, you know, an all or nothing situation. What I'm saying is, I think this matters a bit. All right, it matters. And I think people do deserve to be called out. So I would say this if we have built a society where you impress people by your charitable work, that's a good society. There are a lot of societies where that would not go over that well. Yes, I agree. But we live in a society where people are imp- are impressed by pseudo charitable work. How about this? What? So wait, you don't have a problem with a person getting into a good college because they were a very good bowler or tennis player. Uh, okay, maybe bowling teams don't exist now. Uh, a tennis player or a rower. I got into Harvard. Uh, not just because of my grades, but because I, I was on the so-and-so a championed high school rowing team. Right. So that's okay. I rowed to get into college, but I gave charity to get into college. That's suspect. I don't share that view. No, I, Dennis, it's not that if someone really did and went out. No, no, involved... even no, even if they did it just to get into college. Let's say no, listen, no, wait, wait, wait. you swam largely to get into a good college. Right? Yes. I don't hold it against you. No, no, no. Listen, what I'm saying is this. If you go down to the L.A. homeless shelter or you go to the chemotherapy ward at UCLA Hospital and you give your hours to get into college and you're helping people, I agree with you. That's like rowing or swimming or whatever to get into college. What I am saying is that these people were were creating these websites. Really, They weren't actually okay, going involved. Okay, all right. Well, uh, that was so, my first question. How much good does that charity really do? Well, You're well, arguing okay. that it was a pseudo-charity. Pseudo charities don't count. I'm arguing that it was a pseudo char- charity. However, maybe you know. Well, what 100... if it was a real charity and it was just done to get into college? I just said I agree with you. I think. Oh, uh, so where do we differ? I'm I'm telling you, we're, we differ because the 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 pseudo charities in some ways helped people. For instance, 
I told you it's very common to have these websites with, with these links donate to XYZ. And so maybe as a result of that pseudo charity, maybe 10 or 100 people went and gave some money. And you know what? I can say that that's a good thing because maybe, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars was raised to help people who wouldn't have otherwise gotten that money. However, I do think it is worth at least calling out that those people didn't get their butt up and go and volunteer. They just created some dumb website and to take credit for this charity. And I don't think that we should be celebrating people who do that. And I don't think that colleges should be rewarding people who do that because it's fake and it's, it's using only fake if it did minimal good it's using it's not people fake, who are who are not, suffering okay. to get into college all right all right and not actually it, so, really helping them okay then we don't differ we don't i i don't think if we it differ. doesn't really help anybody of course it's phony and this the college should be seduced by it yeah but if they did an actual charity just to get into college i agree good was achieved i i agree with you and it is also possible it may not be likely but it is possible that when you get into the habit of giving charity or forming charities, it may stay with you. Fair enough. Even when you're not trying to get into college. Just like you continued swimming. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Oy. Oy vey. <laughs> swimming was so awful. I'm telling you that, that it, it is. Well, wait, I also want to pause. I, just to, I didn't get recruited to play or to swim in college. I know that. So I, oh, want, yeah, I, I don't want people to think I, no, I swam, it, got it, recruited, and then stopped. No, I didn't get recruited. No, but there's no doubt. Oh, of your, course. Your, your swimming ability was a big help because so many people have great grades. Well, also, I demonstrated that I And, and you played and I... oboe while swimming. Oh, yeah. Which, that was remarkable mm -hmm. to be able to do that underwater. But this on this subject of these, these, and again, I, we agree. If someone's going and doing the work, even if it's to get into college, I appreciate okay, that they're doing it. Enough. But these pseudo charities with the websites, okay, they drive right. me crazy. Gotcha. I, what do you think? Do you think that person deserves to be kind of, you know, when I say a person deserves all to I be care called about, out. Uh, all I care about is did the charity do good? The motives for making it. But he, that you know, the motives for making it are are only important to people who are determining whether to incorporate this person into their personal life. In other words, let's say it was a guy and you were set up on a date with him, okay? And you were told, you know, I just want you to know this guy set up a charity to get into Harvard or to get into wherever, some mm -hmm. another prestigious college. You, in in deciding, do I want do I want to take this man seriously as a potential mate in life? I really want to know what makes him tick. That's very fair. Mm -hmm. For the rest of us, I the only question of interest to me, since I'm not going to marry him or yep. try to make him my best friend, is did his charitable work do good? Yes. Doing good is my bottom line. Yes. It is not the only bottom line if you want to marry the person or be a friend of the person. But for the rest of humanity, the other 7 billion people, that's the bottom line. Did mm -hmm. it do good? The problem I have with these websites even if you know they they give some money to people who otherwise wouldn't have had it is because then i think it perpetuates this pseudo charity cycle where people are going oh that's what you need to do to yeah, get I understand. And, 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 and i just think it it fosters a a disingenuous well all right so how about this let's say everybody who tried to get into a prestigious university started a charity then they would compete on effectiveness true and that that would well, increase well, good on earth. See, well, actually, the 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 evidence, at least that I saw, doesn't bear that out because because they none because, of them do any good. Well, because so, how, so many but, people had these websites, right? So so they weren't competing the, for so being the, better. Okay, then the colleges won't be seduced. They if are I, seduced. Well, if everybody has it, I mean, if so yeah. vast numbers of kids, how, why is it seductive? Well, they continue the, to accept the colleges these people. colleges are that stupid that they think that this thing is important when it's not doing really any good work. All right. Anyway, I can't. I can't address that. 
I, I, I just want to go to my my bottom bottom line that oh sorry we can I overrate say one thing? thoughts and underrate actions. Can I say one thing that's really 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 important? The thing also that bothered me about these these pseudo charity websites is there are people in our own community that that need help. You know, like for instance, there was this there was this uh, person who started this charity about like immigration, and there were people who worked at our school who were probably immigrants i'm they they were immigrants you know and and or they they lived in immigrant community and it's like help the people in your own community you know don't go so global put your name on a website you're the ceo well, of the, okay. the immigrant charity this is another great go scene out and for help. goodness sake by the way and you will be very happy to know that the talmudic principle there is a principle in the jewish religion I'll say it in Hebrew to give it credibility. The poor of your city come first. Gold dealers are a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. What sets these companies apart and who can you really trust? This is Julie Hartman for Amfed Coin in Bullion, Dennis's choice for buying precious metals. When you buy precious metals, it's imperative that you buy from a trustworthy and transparent dealer that protects your best interests. So many companies use gimmicks to take advantage of inexperienced gold and silver buyers. Be cautious of brokers offering free gold and silver or brokers that want to sell you overpriced collectible coins, claiming that they appreciate more than gold and silver. What about hidden commissions and huge markups? Nick Rovich and his team at AmFed have always had Dennis's back. Nick's been in the industry for over 42 years, and he's established a reputation built on trust, transparency, and fair pricing. If you're interested in buying or selling, call Nick and his team at Amfed Coin and Bullion, 1-800-221-7694, AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. Yes, that's what it was. Help the people in your own community. You know, the global, like, USA against homeless. There are people on Skid Row two miles from our school who you should be going out and handing out baguettes and water to. Right. Let's, you know, let's right. start in our okay. own community right. instead of putting your face yeah. on okay. some WordPress thing and saying you're a CEO. Right. It so it just comes down to the bottom line. Was it effective? If it's, if it's a sham charity... It's not right. impressive. If it did good for the, for the sole reason of getting into Harvard, I, I don't care. Mm -hmm. the, we can't rate people on, on their motives. And, and that's, you know, one, one of my lectures on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur for the high holy days that I led, and you were at some of the services, it, it, was, it was about that, and I cited source after source because people who differ with me, religious people who differ with me, they'll say, well, you know what, Dennis, don't bad things start with bad thoughts? Hmm. And that, that's like saying, Dennis, don't hit and run drivers start by driving? Right. Every, every hit and run driver started by driving. But the argument against driving mm -hmm. is, is, is absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of people with bad thoughts who do good is gigantic, and the number of people with good thoughts who do bad is also gigantic. I think we agree about the bad thoughts and the good thoughts. I, I think our discussion, at least to me, is more about motives. Yes, uh, even motives, yes. And I, so, I, I, right. Yeah, that's true. It's not the same as thoughts. It's not the same. Let me, right. let me give you a contemporary example, Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek is both loved and hated by Republicans. It's really been interesting to see. There are some people who really... Uh, what do they hate about him? They call him Vivek the fake. They say that he apparently, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I, I really want to be careful before I say these things because this is what I read, but I haven't substantiated it. I'm telling you what I heard. Okay, it could be false. I heard that he was on like the COVID board in the state of Ohio and he voted for lockdowns or he advocated for lockdowns in 2020. People are saying he took like a Soros money grant. Again, un I could be, my details could be off on this, but what I've been hearing and reading, this is what people are saying, um, that he was said some critical things about Trump and then kind of turned around. Anyway, he here's the point. 
I think that Vivek, what Vivek says when he's when he's railing against the administrative state and climatism and the victim mentality that we have in this country, I think he's excellent. I think he would be an excellent president. But a lot of people are focusing on his motives of getting into the race because they 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 say, although what he is saying right now, I agree with. There's evidence that this guy may not be what we think he is, and we don't want him to right. win the presidency so he, and turn he, right. out to be a fake. So that's not motives. Is he lying about what he's saying now in light of what you're reporting might be true then? Here are the num- here are your options. It's He's saying everything he is saying just to get elected. He doesn't believe a word or very little of what he says. Uh, num- number two, he has changed his mind and does mean what he says. Mm-hmm. Number three, the things that are reported in the past are not accurate. Right. So th- there are th- those are the three possibilities, right? That he has changed his mind, he is insincere, uh, he uh, is misreported. Those are your three options. So being a public figure, let me tell you, uh, the number of people who believe, for example, that I advocate people use the N-word oh, yeah, uh, is in the millions because of was... the left lying, pure lies about what I actually said. Uh, and they, they, they quoted... Just as Bill O'Reilly, by the way, is fascinating how he said there's a six-second uh, video on CNN when they're doing a report on Fox on CNN and, you know, the, the stars of the past. And, and so he, and he, show, he, he told me what they took, and then he told me the context. When you don't give the context of a comment, when I said it, it is absurd that we can never say the N-word, and I even said it is despicable right. to call a black the N-word, but I said we can say kike. We don't say the K-word, right. and that's the N-word with regard to Jews. Mm-hmm. That's all I was referring to. We say f- Oh, we say, yes, but it is it's horrible to say it about a gay of co- person. Of course. But to course. say the word. Right. The Jacksonville, in, in a recent, um, uh, um, I don't know, I think some... Uh, racial incident the Jacksonville pol- I believe it was Jacksonville Florida police chief a black man uh, used the n-word the whole word in a press conference to say what was said was that wrong of course it wasn't wrong was he going to say he used the n-word it's almost sound do you know there is no other word that people say that about no, it's it's a good point, and and the point is you were not advocating. That yes, you, you were talking that's right. about like when I just said, F-, it's it's horrible to call gapers and that, but we can say the full word when yes, we're referring to it as a slur. that's all it means. Just like with why want Jews called kike? Of if course, if you do, you're a, you're so, a despicable human being if you do that. But that I can't say the word, and I I was talking about McCullough's biography of Truman. Truman used both the K word and the N word. And, and I said, I could say the K word, kike, but I can't say the N word. That's absurd. Right. So your point, bringing it back to the point is that, is that we were talking about Yes, Vivek. about Vivek. So I don't know. That's the, it's a big problem. The press is, yes, is utterly is. untrustworthy. It is. I literally do not know when the New York Times is telling the truth. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. They don't always lie, but they lie so often or they omit so often and thereby lie, I never know when it's true. I, the only time I know that the New York Times is telling the truth if is there is no political dimension. Right. The number of people killed in an earthquake in Ecuador, I believe the New York Times. Yes, yes. Can I pivot for a moment, shifting away just for a second about this motives discussion? Because what you just said about the press is so true. You, you know a moment, and I know this is sort of... Um, not common for Dennis and Julie because we kind of stay stay macro, but I'll I'll relate this to a macro, this this micro news story to a macro subject. But you know what really shook me recently was when Tucker Carlson uh, released the video that Speaker McCarthy handed over to him the forty thousand hours of January six footage that was not shown to the public by the January sixth committee. Tucker Carlson sh- showed. The QAnon shaman, Jacob Chansley, that guy with horns, who, who was thrown in prison for a 41-month sentence for insurrection or whatever the heck he was charged with, 
Tucker Carlson showed this footage of nine different Capitol Police officers escorting Jacob Chansley through the inside of the Capitol, opening the doors of the Senate to him. Jacob Chansley goes up to the front of the Senate and leads a prayer in which he thanks the Capitol Police officers for helping him, you know, get into the Capitol. The officers on tape are right there. And that was not shown to the American people until the the House switched to Republican. The Speaker got the footage, handed it over to Tucker, and Tucker showed all of us that. I mean, that alone, and this guy, this guy was, thank God, released from prison as a result of that footage because that footage was not shown during his trial, and it was exculpatory evidence that was not that was not provided. So he was released from prison. And obviously, there are so many examples of of the media lot. The Hunter Biden thing was was Russian. The laptop was Russian disinformation. COVID came from a bat. Donald Trump colluded with. I mean, we could write paragraphs of, of lies. But for some reason, that one really shook me because I'm like, how can the American people not see what's going on here? That that this I mean, that was a bombshell thing that Capitol Police officers were leading people in, on January 6th through the Capitol. And that he led a prayer on their he, behalf. What what do you I mean what an old America would be so outraged by this. Mm-hmm. People would understand, even if they didn't, you know, even even if they're not Republican, you know, even if they're the staunchest, most Trump hating Democrat, the American people used to be able to see something like that and understand we have been lied to. Are we just jaded? Do people not care that they're being lied to? I don't understand why that wasn't more of a, of a received a, a as a bombshell. A large number of people don't know they're being lied to, don't care to know that they're being lied to. And but I tell, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I have shown that clip to Democrats. And? And, and they go like, oh, well, you know, there's a lot a lot of shady stuff. that They, defla- they just say something stupid All deflecting. Right, so that's what, well, what, isn't that what I just said? They don't want to know the truth. Well, you said, well, right. But the first thing you said is they don't know that they're being lied to. The thing that frightens me. Right, that's fair. That's correct. The thing that frightens me is when they are. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's correct. Why? Well, it was. So last night uh, at at, at Arizona State University, uh, or last night, uh, a few nights ago, to be precise, for when this is uh, aired. So uh, Charlie Kirk and I were speaking to a large student group, or a lot, large group of students, to be more precise. So a guy got up, because Charlie kept saying, if you differ with us, come up first. So a guy comes up to the microphone on, on the floor and says, uh, it's, not a li- it's not a lie when we say men give birth. We're not saying that X, Y chromosomes give birth. Is everybody clear what I'm saying? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Men have X, Y chromosomes. Women right. have two, two X chromosomes. I so believe I'm sorry, repeat what he so said? So he says, we're not saying that X, Y chromosome people give birth. We're saying that men give birth. Or something something to that effect. We're not... You're, you are being irresponsible, Mr. Prager, in implying that the left says men give birth. So I said, but that's exactly what the New York Times, the American Medical Association, the Washington Post, CNN, that's exactly what they say. And I looked at the audience and said, my friends, one of us is not telling you the truth. So finally he said this was precious. Well, both can be right. And what this man, this young man did and millions of Americans are doing is figuring out how to lie because the lie is the the narrative that keeps them from confronting evil. He, He made up this joke. It's a joke. We can both be right. You can't both be right. Either men give birth or they don't give birth. Right. But he had, he had, he had, he, he, the I don't remember dialogues as well as as you would, uh, for example. But because I'm a woman, that's I'm right. XX. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Exactly. I'm a woman and I'm XX. Wow, on every grounds. The, the 
the convoluted reasoning people will use because if a liberal had to confront a liberal, not a leftist, if a liberal had to confront the amount of left-wing lies that permeate our society, they would enter cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. How do I vote Democrat when I'm being told you went through your own list of lies, big lies, not the Trump lies of exaggerating how many were at his, at his inauguration, right. which I couldn't care less about. Right. Big lies that affect society, mm -hmm. that your daughter could become a boy. Yes. That's a gi it's a gi it's, it's a horrific lie. Mm -hmm. It's not just a lie. It's a Goebbels-like lie. It's gigantic. It's life-shattering lying. It's society-shattering lying. But liberals won't won't either they say, oh, it's just a fringe. The, the yeah, number that's what they of, always say. That's what they say. Yeah. Oh, look, that's crazy, Dennis. But, but you know, who thinks that way? Like Bill Maher said to you on that famous that's clip right. in 2012, about small men amount of people. Oh, no, no, well, not, not even small amount of people. It was worse. Dennis, where'd you come up with that one? He thought I made it up. Yep, I know. Yep. You know, what you say is so true. There are people who don't, for, for whom it is too like life shattering to comprehend and internalize that they have been wrong and that they have been lied to. There are some people who clutch on to their worldview, like you know, it is the most important thing to him to them, and they can't. They, they no matter how much evidence is presented to the contrary, they will not relinquish that worldview because I think they view it as an indictment of their whole way of thinking and it, 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 it is it is no it is <laughs> they're but right i'm just explaining that <laughs> yeah. that people No, that's why i said cognitive dissonance it would be shattering it's almost like coming to the realization that your husband has been cheating on you for your whole life that's right i think some people would would rather say oh nope nope right nope, right not cheating on me not that's, that didn't that's happen an excellent excellent analogy analogies are, are important yes i learned that from you you're you are the Analogy the, shaman. <laughs> I am the analogy shaman. <laughs> Jacob uh, Chansley's the Q. And by the way, Q, I just want to say for the record, did you ever hear of QAnon before the left started talking about it? To, Never. I give you my word. I would be prepared to take a lie detector Me test. Me too. Never I heard of it. I have never seen a Q. I don't know what QAnon is. You, they talk about it This is a good like example of a left-wing gigantic lie. Yes. We get our marching orders from something none of us know anything about. And and, and, and by the way, Dennis Prager is saying, I mean, you you are, you uh, have a, I, a, I a conservative to, politics like like no one else, yeah, you know? Well, well certainly uh, among <laughs> the most. And, and right. Alan Estrin, who does so much research on, on these matters to send me articles every day. He never heard of it either. Well, he we all heard of it now, but well, none of, of us before. go to it. We don't know what the hell it is. I, don't, I still don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Is it like a chat? I don't know. A site? I, and I don't even want to go on it. I have no interest. Or or, or the, the the these horrific charges against PragerU uh, of this professor that they all cite, well, they don't really have uh, racist things on their site. But they have dog whistles to racists, or people going to their site will be led to go to racist sites. Mm -hmm. What does that even mean? You know, I said on this show recently that ideologies are as are as much of luxuries as fine cars, jewelry, vacation, homes, etc. In addition to ideologies being luxuries. Ideologies can also be as irresponsible as drunk driving or as, you know, going to school high on marijuana. We, we, don't, we don't see our ways of thinking that way as being A, luxuries, and, and B, what was the word I used? Um, not reckless. As a, damn, it started with a D. Bingo. Dennis and Julia Bingo is uh, when, when you We're forget well aware, something. Yes, doesn't matter though. Go on. I, I the audience is listening, going, 
They just heard yeah. me say it, and they're screaming it in it's, their mind. It's painful. Okay, as reckless. But, you know, like, so recently I was I was talking about what's going on with Russell Brand. He's being accused of, of rape know. and sexual assault. Eight, and, eight, what, eight, 18 years ago or yeah, something? Yeah, from 2006 to 2013. Look, we don't know if he did it. We don't know if he didn't do it. But the U.K. Parliament, a member of the U.K. Parliament, do you know this, sent Rumble, which is the video platform, a letter saying are you going to still have russell brand mm -hmm. on your platform mm -hmm. in the wake of these allegations are you going to allow him to monetize uh get money off of his denying these allegations that is terrifying and and one of the things i said when i reported on it is this is the offshoot of the believe all women slogan that has been passed around i literally if you look at the past like eight years i, I can i can chart the, this on a graph it starts out in a classroom or at a restaurant or you know just chatting casually with friends oh we have to believe all women believe all women then that ideology that that idea circulates like a virus then it becomes mainstream people believe or people really adopt this idea believe all women believe all women and then it becomes such a part of our culture that it goes all the way up to literally a member of the UK parliament now trying to demonetize this guy because he's been accused of something. He hasn't even been proven to have done it, but because we should believe all women, he should be he should be deemed as guilty before being proven believe all, innocent. Believe all women means women can't lie. It is an offshoot of something I heard in the 70s at, at college. Or university it was graduate school then and that was blacks can't be racist blacks cannot be racist yes women cannot lie is it, it they, they don't they're the opposite of everything i believe the left we, they don't divide the world between good and bad but between male and female black and white we need to start stigmatizing those ideas as being as this is the word irresponsible that was the word i used yeah, as that's being a, you said it began with d i know i realized that was so stupid i don't know Dir i thought i had was it i thought it irresponsible irresponsible that's okay, what it was yeah, yes yeah. i know i realized that was that was wrong um i we, we need to stigmatize those ideas as being irresponsible. We don't think of ideas as being irresponsible. We think of, of drunk driving as being irresponsible. But, but saying that no black person can be racist and all women should be believed, that is irresponsible because it leads well, to what we're seeing now. No, it, it, it's, it's immoral. It, it not, irresponsible is too mild. It is literally the opposite of morality right. because it doesn't judge truth. It judges who says it but people don't care about morale i i'm not disagreeing with you but people don't You're that's right. not going to resonate yes. it's immoral reckless and irresponsible might uh -huh. resonate more well, I that's don't know. interesting i wonder well I, I would say this among those who already believe that blacks can't be racist which is the, we're talking about a, bre a broad swath of society. Mm -hmm. Blacks cannot be racist is not even just left. It's it's now liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know who whom it would register among, but it is it is worthy of making those points, which is why we exist. We try. Thou et moi. Any final thought? What's your Instagram? My Instagram is doing well, and yours? <laughs> I said, what's your Instagram? Not how's your That's Instagram. That's very personal. Uh, I mean, I, you know I'm very open. It's actually not that personal. What's that... your Instagram is who? Well, your handle is the Dennis Prager. So it's if you're the Dennis Prager, oh, you're public. The so, Dennis Prager. Yes. Your Instagram's great. They post really good clips uh, from Dennis do? and Julia okay. and, That's and radio. That's important. Yes. Good. So you can follow Dennis at the Dennis Breaker. You can follow me at Julie R. Hartman. I haven't been elevated to the status of the yet. Maybe one day I will. And you can catch Dennis and Julie. So would you rather be the or happily married? What do you mean? Would you rather be the Julie Hartman? Yes. Or a happily married woman who isn't the Julie Hartman? Uh, why can't I be both? I didn't say you can't. I'm asking which you want more. What do you think? 
happily married. Yes. The first question Dennis ever asked me was, "Do if you had one guarantee in life, right. it would be career or yes. marriage?" I, was that and really? And I said it? marriage. And I was and I was still kind of a little yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah. See, that's final point. Shows you, I, I. I I used to say that I was like awake or I like came to conservatism. I actually think it was always in me mm -hmm. and Prager you brought it out and people like you brought, gave me the vocabulary to attach to it. That's fair. So I think there's, there's a lot of people for whom that is true for, but they need things. They need Prager you. Anyway, you can watch Dennis and Julie every Monday on this channel, the Julie Hartman YouTube channel. It premieres at 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern. And of course, you can listen to it anytime by downloading it on Apple and Spotify. But I think watching it is particularly fun. In, in this case, yes. In my radio show's case, I hope Salem doesn't mind me saying, I don't think it matters. But for us, I think it, it's very more engaging. So you can see my outfits at the very least. And Dennis's outfits, too. That's the first thing on people's minds. Shalom, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, indeed. Oh, and Julie at julie-hartman.com. Forgot to throw that in there. <laughs>